Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Pete Timmerman. I'm the director of the Webster University Film Series. Um, tonight is the kickoff event of our April Fulci series, which we've very much been looking forward to. Um, I'll get to our film and our speaker, but first I wanted to introduce who I am, what we do. I know we have some new faces in the audience, uh, so I wanted to make sure, I don't know, I wanted to sell myself and the, the film series to everybody. Um, so the Webster University Film Series is St. Louis's only year-round nonprofit movie theater. Uh, we usually show movies in person in the Winifred Moore Auditorium, which is that picture there, as you can probably guess. Um, but we can't show anything in person now. Um, I'm not expecting to go back to in-person until August, so we've had a long period of darkness. But we do keep, keep doing plenty of events. Um, we're doing um, both these virtual events, like what you're at now, of course, but then also um, a virtual cinema where I book the films that we would have booked in person, and then you just pay to watch them alone, you know, like in your house, sad, um, instead. It's not as fun as the communal experience, of course. I'm looking forward to going back to in-person. But in the meantime, it gives you opportunities to see the films that we would have booked, which we're, we tend to be very proud of and stand behind. Um, so to look at what we've got right now, um, ending tonight, we have three films by the Brazilian filmmaker Maya Darin, Lands, Margin, and The Fever. Uh, the Fever is kind of tenuously narrative, where Lands and Margin are kind of tenuously documentary. Um, Incidentally, the, all three films are shot and set in the area that Cannibal Holocaust is shot and set. Um, so that's just a coincidence. They're nothing like Cannibal Holocaust at all. Um, but anyway, yeah, those close after tonight. Um, but if you wanted to rent them tonight, you still get the full 72 hour rental period. Um, but the links to rent them are at webster.edu slash film series, which is what I'm showing you now. Uh, you've got one week left on a film that is very difficult to talk about. That's a lot of the reason that I prompted me to um, share my screen instead of trying to say this out loud. The film is uh, Wojnarowicz, and I've, around the office I've been calling it F-U, F-word, f, -F, -word, f um, But yeah, it's a documentary about David Wojnarowicz, and it's terrific. I absolutely love it. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Richard Brody, the film critic for The New Yorker, he says it's one of the best films of the year. Honestly, it's one of my favorite things I've had in the virtual cinema, period. Um, but you've got one more, week, one more week to rent that. And then tomorrow, another one of my favorite films that we've had in the virtual cinema opens. It's called uh, This Is Not a Burial, It's a Resurrection. Um, it's from Lesotho, and it's the first time Lesotho has ever submitted a film to the Academy for consideration in the Best International Film Oscar category. Um, so I guess, yeah, thanks for hearing me out in terms of our virtual screenings. I'll come back to our future uh, April Fulci speakers. Uh, but next, I wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have two sponsors on board for April Fulci's. The first one that came on board was Messed Up Puzzles. Uh, Messed Up Puzzles gets the rights to like the official artwork for the types of movies that we're celebrating here, and they turn them into puzzles. So you, you can probably gather, you can probably gather from the company's title. Uh, we have registration prizes for these April Fulci's events, to where if you register and attend any of the events, you're automatically entered to win uh, one of the prizes. One of the prizes we have is our speaker tonight, Kia Wilson's novel, and um, we have two Fulci puzzles to give away too. Um, the agreement that I made with the um, messed up puzzles guy is that any the people that win can just pick any in stock Fulci puzzle. So New York Ripper is an option. Zombie here is an option, and of course the Beyond is an option. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything, so I won't go too much into detail. But he has more Fulci puzzles coming, so you've got that to look forward to too. And uh, let me see, my tabs are buried here. There we go. Uh, my other sponsor is Left Bank Books. Um, Left Bank Books does all kinds. Of, they actually have an event opposite this one, so I was glad that they were happy to come on this one as a sponsor. But they made a landing page in their book club section to where if you want to buy any of the books by any of the April Fulci speakers, they're all in one place. Um, so if you navigate to their website and go to events book clubs, um, all the way at the bottom, you have the option to buy, sorry, you have the option to buy the books from the speakers that are going to be speaking this month, including Kia Wilson's book, We Eat Our Own, which I'll come to in just a second. Um, let me stop sharing. Okay. So that finally leads me to tonight's event. Um, so like I said, tonight is the first of April Fulci's. Um, next week, we have Aaron Christensen. Um, you might know as Dr. AC. Um, he's going to talk about City of the Living Dead. Um, he, he's the guy behind Horror 101 with Dr. AC, the website. He used to write for Horror Hound Magazine. He's won a Rondo Award for genre film journalism, et cetera. Uh, week after next, we're having Andy Treifenbach speak about the beyond. Um, Andy is the longtime programmer and the creator of Late Night Grindhouse, the popular uh, midnight movie series here in St. Louis, uh, which at one time we tried to bring to the Webster film series, but it didn't quite work out. Um, he also started the website destroythebrain.com, but that's Andy two weeks from now. Three weeks from now, we have Aaron Abishan, who's the associate dean of the School of Communications, of the School of Communications, the largest school that houses the Webster film series. 
Um, Aaron has taught a topics class on horror films twice in the past three-ish years, and the first time he taught it, we showed his films in the film series, which was a very popular series, uh, Grave Tales, where he went through the history of horror. And then the last speaker this month um, on the 28th, 29th rather, I'm sorry, is Troy Howarth. Um, Troy Howarth is a prolific recorder of audio commentaries. Um, if you have the Blue Underground disc of Zombie, he's the guy that recorded the commentary on it. He also did the commentary on House by the Cemetery. He did the commentary on New York Ripper, on uh, Don't Torture a Duckling, which is the one he's presenting with us. And he wrote a biography on Fulci called Splintered Visions. Um, so finally, that brings me to Kia. Um, my trajectory with Kia is interesting. Um, she wrote a novel called We Eat Our Own. Um, it was published in 2016. And I first came to learn about We Eat Our Own from a very positive review in the New York Times uh, book review. Um, so I read this review and I was like, oh, hey, you know, mental note, I wanna read this book. It's loosely based on the making of Cannibal Holocaust. Um, and then a little while later, a few months went by, Kia spoke at the local BookFest St. Louis event. Um, I don't remember if it was in the lead up to BookFest St. Louis or actually at the event, which I attended, but I learned that she used to work at Left Bank Books, which I shop at all the time. Um, so it's, just, it's like, oh, I guess I probably dealt with her at some point. And then I read her book. Um, I think the very high praise for her book is it made me want to watch Cannibal Holocaust again. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's, that's no small feat. I feel like Cannibal Holocaust is a one and done movie for most people. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> your, your book made me want to read it again. So congratulations. Um, I guess I'll get out of the way now. One last thought, though, is um, after Kia presents, we'll have time at the end for like a Q&A slash discussion. Um, if you have questions along the way, it's handy if you put them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. It's possible that Kia will get to them, um, but it's still nice to, when her presentation is over, to be able to roll right into the Q&A. I feel like the audience questions will be a lot smarter than my own questions. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to what your questions are. Um, so please don't be shy about putting them in, putting them in the Q&A. Anyway, I will shut up now. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And Kia, I'll give you the floor. Great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You're gonna see a little Google thing. Uh, cool. Can everyone see what I am doing? I don't know, someone wants to pop in the chat and just give me a thumbs up or Pete can nod, great. Um, so thank you uh, so much Pete for that kind introduction. Um, so as you have certainly noticed by now, you can fully see all of my lecture notes on this slide. Uh, I wanna first assure you that I'm doing this on purpose for accessibility purposes. And also because frankly, in this era of infinite Zooms and accompanying Zoom fatigue, I have just personally found it easier to engage with a presentation if I can dip in and out of a live transcription when I feel myself glazing over. Um, I have a day job where I'm on a lot of like government Zoom calls and this has saved me <laughs> several times. Um, I thought I'd replicate a little of that experience here, albeit minus the hilarious robo reader non sequitur that we've all come to know and love. If it drives you bats or you find it distracting, I will 100% not be offended. If you shrink my notes out of frame, images will always be on the left side of the screen and you will not miss anything by listening rather than reading. And I promise I will riff a little bit off of this as well, uh, just to keep things interesting. So let's go ahead and say goodbye to this cute little guy for now. Okay, um, so uh, Pete told you a little bit about my book, but I thought I'd kick this off by telling you briefly just a little bit about who I am and why I'm here as a novelist <laughs> um, of all things. Unlike most of the incredibly impressive roster of people presenting during this series, seriously, huge kudos to Pete on this lineup. I cannot wait to listen into all of these talks. I am not a film critic, nor a filmmaker, nor a Fulci biographer, nor honestly an expert of any kind on this movie or any other. <laughs> like I imagine a lot of you watching this, I primarily identify as a fan of great filmmaking in general, and in particular, a deep horror goon is my preferred identifier, albeit one who has some complicated feelings about my own love of the genre. And I am also a novelist who wrote a book that was in large part my attempt to muck around in the question of what exactly I enjoy about watching movies where people get variously impaled, vivisected and devoured, including some ones like the film we are discussing tonight, which are gorgeous works of art that are also marbled through with impossible to miss racism, sexism, colonialism, and general bullshit. You just you gotta acknowledge it and talk about it. And we certainly will. So um, just by way of segue, my novel was based very loosely, as Pete mentioned, on the making of a film called Cannibal Holocaust. It's got its 
a uh, very tasteful <laughs> cover up on the left hand side there, which I mentioned only because it shares quite a bit of DNA with Zombie. Both of them were filmed in the late 70s. Cannibal Holocaust was released in 1980, Zombie 2, as it was released in Italy, and as I will refer to it throughout the presentation interchangeably in 1979. Um, and they were directed by prolific Italian auteurs who had long and surprisingly diverse careers that spanned all sorts of genres from made for TV family comedies to the disgusting Splatterfest for which they are best known today. The director of Cannibal Holocaust was a guy named Ruggiero Deodato. Now in his 80s, he's actually still directing sporadically. Um, Fulci died in 1996. We'll talk about his life a little bit later. Like a lot of Italian filmmakers of this period, both directors cast their often unknown actors from around the world, had them perform their lines in their respective native languages and recorded entire scenes without sync sound and then dubbed over everyone's voices at the end. Uh, so no, it was not just your particular recording that felt a little bit wonky, that's how they all are, um, which gives the film either a very cheap quality or a very effective sense of dissociative unreality, depending on your perspective. Personally, I think it's both. I like it about these movies. And of course, both were included in the UK's infamous video nasty list of films deemed too obscene for public consumption, which only fueled their popularity in cult circles and grindhouse theaters around the world. Fulci had several films on this list, including Zombie and The Beyond. City of the Living Dead narrowly missed the cut, but was still occasionally seized by UK police. Good on Webster for highlighting only the grossest <laughs> films in his canon. Uh, Deodato and Fulci also share the ignominious distinction of actually being charged with crimes because their films were so violent. Um, Deodato with murder because certain special effects in Cannibal Holocaust were so realistic that film critics alleged it must be a literal snuff film and Fulci with animal cruelty for a very convincing dog vivisection scene in Lizard in a Woman's Skin. Neither of them were found guilty in real life. You'll have to read my novel to find out what happened to De Deodato's fictional simulacrum in the end. That's my last self-promotion pitch for the day. Um, but arguably, unlike Cannibal Holocaust, no disrespect to Ruggiero, he's my guy, um, Fulci's zombie has endured not just as the stuff of urban legend, but as a critically respected film in its own right that it exceeds its schlocky branding to achieve the status of, in my opinion, an art house epic, not in everyone's opinion. Um, and that has everything to do with the genius of Fulci himself as a director, as a director uniquely capable of cultivating nightmarish and stunningly original juxtapositions without ever violating the tight filmic vocabulary of the horror genre. He's also one of the single best screenwriters in his cohort, in my opinion, though he didn't write the script for this particular film, though he did do a lot of things to the script. So I think he kind of deserves a screenwriting credit. I'm aware that this is an intense thing to say about Zombie 2, a film that was actually marketed as an unauthorized sequel to George A. Romero's 1978 classic Dawn of the Dead, despite the fact that Fulci's film has literally nothing to do with that movie. What a bold thing. Um, quick aside for anyone else who cannot keep Romero's many, many similarly titled movies straight, Dawn is the one that takes place in an abandoned shopping mall with the fantastic motorcycle gang versus zombie scene. Um, and I should have clarified in these notes that um, the reason that Fulci was allowed to do this was there was a weird thing in Italian copyright law in the time that allowed everyone to make sequels of their favorite films with no legal consequences, which I find kind of amazing. Fulci himself rejected his distributor's decision to lure viewers into theaters by capitalizing on Romero's runaway success in Italy. Don, if you don't know, was an Italian-American co-production with a big assist from filmmaker Dario Argento, with whom Fulci nursed something of a rivalry. We'll talk about his rivalries a little bit more later. Um, but personally, I actually kind of liked reading, like reading Zombie as a loose continuation of the Romero multiverse. In a way, every horror movie is a kind of a sequel, right? In that horror as a genre revels in being infinitely self-referential. Horror directors pay tribute to or outright steal whole sequences from other directors. Horror screenwriters play upon long-held tropes and narrative structures that have been torqued and riffed upon since literally the dawn of film itself. The earliest films were horror films. Um, Fulci's Zombie doesn't share any characters, settings, or 
significant connective tissue with Romero's specific zombie oeuvre, um, besides, of course, the mindless humanoid monsters themselves. But neither does Dawn of the Living, Night of the Living Dead and its ostensible sequel, Dawn of the Dead, or Dawn and its sequel, Day of the Dead. Point is, all zombie films are certainly drawing from the same creative well, if not from exactly the same story bible. Fulci Zombie is certainly a standout of the undead genre in many ways, but it is actually not terribly unique in one key respect. The way it uses the infinitely plastic allegorical properties of the zombie figure itself, which has been used to represent, you name it, um, every aspect of American life in particular. Um, but here it is used to represent white colonizers fear of indigenous revolts, which is unfortunately one of the most common and racist tropes of the genre. It's all over the place. Fulci's film has a lot in common with the first zombie film ever made, 1932's White Zombie, which also depicted a band of heathen islanders who wield the powers of voodoo to variously zombify and terrorize white visitors to their island. White Zombie was loosely based on a travelogue written by American journalist William Seabrook, who, who journeyed to Haiti and mistook or more likely conflated the magic process of zombification, itself a severe misunderstanding of rituals performed in African diasporic religions on the island, with the exhausted shuffling posture of slaves forced to work 18-hour days on American-owned plantations. It's gross. Fulci Zombie, at least, gives its viewers the thrill of seeing the resurrected natives reclaim the new world that was stolen from the conquistadors by the conquistadors who slaughtered them. The fact that the zombies arrive by boat offers a pleasing little twist on the Plymouth Roth, Plymouth Roth story. Um, but the mindless ravenous rampage of a revenant horde is not exactly like restorative justice, let's be honest. And there's just no avoiding the way this film perpetuates racist and colonial tropes throughout its runtime. It has to be discussed and I'm sure we'll talk about it more in the Q&A. Um, where zombie absolutely exceeds the trappings of a genre though, and this is in its visual storytelling, that's what I find really redemptive, which consistently pushes the boundaries of the splatter fest in surprising and often sublime ways. Arguably the most famous scene in the film is elevated from what frankly sounds like a pretty bong hitty mashup of two late 70s horror standbys, like dude, what if a zombie fought a shark, into a stupendous kind of water ballet, thanks to cinematographer Sergio Salvati's fascination with the fluid physicality of his performers and the dazzling, almost muscular quality of the ocean light itself. The zombie actor, played by the criminally uncredited Ramon Bravo, who I think is very good here, was also the shark trainer, which made possible Salvati's impossibly lingering shots of his death-defying spectacle in a way that Spielberg, um, Steven Spielberg to be clear, who relied heavily on expensive puppetry and aggressive editing for the most memorable scenes in Jaws could only dream of. Feeding the shark a hearty meal of horse meat and a heavy dose of tranquilizers immediately before the film did not hurt either. The resulting scene flickers between delightful camp and oddly beautiful surrealist nightmare. Though as an aside, Fulci cannot take credit for it. He famously thought the concept for the scene was so ridiculous that he refused to direct it and a second unit was brought in to do it for him, though he did allow it to make the final cut of the film. I also just want to briefly give a shout out to the production design of this film, which really stood out to me on my most recent rewatch as an underrated element of this movie. Um, most modern zombie films we love today are set in either ruined post-apocalyptic wastelands or if the outbreak is a little bit more fresh, bottlenecked farmsteads as in Night of the Living Dead. By contrast, Dr. David Menard's extremely 70s island cabana looks positively sumptuous, and a lot of the costuming is pretty glamorous too, at least compared to the usual camo and ruined street clothes survivalist aesthetic we get served in other undead films. Production designer slash costume designer Walter Pat Patriarca, whose name I cannot pronounce, isn't particularly well known today, but I wanted to give him a shout out for injecting a crucial note of fashion and elegance to contrast all the ugliness and gore that permeates this film. I think it's really effective. Side note before we move on, um, this is actually a lobby card from the German edition of the film. Yes, Zombie slash Zombie 2 was also released under the name Wuzu in addition to a panoply of other titles that we'll go through a little bit later. Of course, 
Um, no discussion of Fulci's work or of late 70s horror film in general is complete without at least a brief mention of the music, which is such an integral part of creating the unique tone and atmosphere of his most pivotal scenes. Um, Fabrizio Frizzi's score for Zombie 2 is often ranked among the best horror soundtracks ever made and is stacked against the work of composer-director John Carpenter and Dario Argento's favorite musical collaborators, Italian prog rock band Goblin. One Rolling Stone article in particular praised this soundtrack's unpredictability, citing its, quote, I love this, noisy electronic gulps, goofy exotica, muffled disco, reiki and marimba, lots of frantic drumming, and mellotron moans that Fritzi calls the sound of the dead. Like, what else could be described that way? The sequence composed for the eye gouging scene was famously inspired by the Beatles song A Day in the Life, which you can hear in its furious crescendos and crashing pianos, though you will have to turn out a lot of blood curdling screams laid over top of that to get the full experience. On a broad story level two, zombies surprise us from its literal opening shot. Even by 1979, it was already a cliche for horror movies to open with a decontextualized glimpse of the eventual climactic moment of the film. We see that all the time. Um, in this case, Dr. David Menard shooting one of his colleagues just as he begins to reanimate in a single unscreen capable flash before we cut to the title card. But as the film goes on, it becomes less clear that the scene even like is the peak of the film's action or that Menard is even its principal character. He doesn't appear on screen again for a significant chunk of the movie as Dardano Sacchetti's script yanks us swiftly away from the fictional island of Matul, which is spelled 7,000 ways on the internet, don't know if I got it right, and back to New York Harbor. After a disorienting smash cut to the Big Apple, we meet our ostensible final girl, Anne Bowles, played by Tisa Farrow, sister of fellow scream queen Mia. Rosemary's Baby is one of my favorite films, um, who is soon joined by what feels like the requisite horror movie band of fellow adventurers slash lambs to the slaughter. But her quest to find out what happened to her researcher father on the tool shores becomes borderline relevant as the madness of the film unfurls. Raise your hand if you even remember that this entire movie was supposed to be a rescue minute. Mish and I forgot halfway through. Eventually, it becomes clear that even the backstory behind the zombie uprising itself, a non-specific conquistador's graveyard, a voodoo curse cast by someone for reasons, uh, well, it's, it's gonna be left a little bit hand wavy. It's not the point. But as the horrors accumulate, we start to suspect that Fulci's project is not to build a traditional and recognizable plot arc that ushers us um, or his characters through a gauntlet of dangers before delivering them to salvation and denouement, the fiction business slash your ninth grade English class, we call that Freytag's Triangle. Um, but instead, he wants to hold the viewer in a state of sustained anxiety. At least in my reading of his work, Fulci's intent as a storyteller is rarely to make you root for the survival of any one person on screen, but instead to create immersively terrifying experiences that may grant us brief moments of relief and culmination, but certainly don't allow us to land there or linger there for very long. That sense that a film is threatening the viewer personally is a surprisingly tricky thing to accomplish in the horror genre, if you think about it. Horror so often explicitly invites us to psychically distance ourselves from the violence inflicted upon the characters, even to the point where we can laugh at it because it's so ridiculous and over the top. A perennially popular analysis of why human beings have always told horrifying stories is that they create a safe space for a catharsis, a concept borrowed from ancient Greek tragedy, which lets us explore and release a little of our oppressed fears of death and mutilation without actually being threatened in any real way. Catharsis literally means to purge or to cleanse. And under this theory, when we watch this happen into, well, this <laughs> happen to Greek actress Olga Karlatos, we actually vent off a little bit of our own fear of experiencing a similar violence. But throughout this film, Fulci keeps hinting that his intention for his, his audience is a little bit different, I think. Um, he keeps forcing us to contend with hyper-realistic horror of mangled bodies and faces, and at other points, clearly fake, but still pretty damn distur disturbing examples of filmic violence. But he also wants us to look at the instruments that inflict that horror upon those bodies. I'm talking about guns and splinters and reaching undead hands angling directly at the camera lens, the camera holding steady on 
on the most graphic scenes for so painfully, sometimes like pornographically long, that it suggests we aren't being delivered simply a cheap jump scare, but that we are meant to actually witness something, to sit with an image, no matter how uncomfortable it might seem designed to make us. The act of witnessing terrible things is an explicit theme throughout much of Fulci's work that I imagine we're gonna talk about a lot over the course of the next month. A lot of critical ink has been spilled on his obsession with eyes, particularly eyeballs being gouged out of faces, having their pupils erased by prophecy or otherwise injured in some way, as well as with psychics and mediums and other characters who are granted powers of paranormal sight. Zombie is the only film in this series that doesn't include a specific reference to extrasensory perception, but there are numerous there are numerous scenes of conspicuously extended watching where Fulci's camera holds for so long on something grotesque or disturbing, a splinter penetrating a woman's eye, a horde of zombies shuffling so gradually towards the camera that what we're watching almost ceases to be frightening and becomes instead like a fascinating cinematic object rather than upset an upsetting act of violence that affects us on a physical visceral level. I won't show you a still from that eyeball scene again, because frankly, in screen cap form, it is legitimately disturbing. Um, but personally, when I watch that scene, I always hit this point where I find myself moving through the horror of what I'm witnessing and start thinking more about how they accomplish that truly impressive visual effect. As an aside, um, a thing I tell anyone who's like, I can't watch horror movies is read up a little bit on how special effects are done and analyze every scary, gory, bloody moment through the lens of how it was done technically. And you will have a totally different experience of the film. Pro tip if you wanna get your aunt into horror. There's an emerging recognition among psychologists that people who have experienced trauma and particularly those who suffer from PTSD actually experience a numbing response when they witness cinematic violence that reminds them of their original trauma in some way. In one famous experiment, researchers showed Vietnam veterans combat scenes from the film Platoon and found that their subjects brains released a large amount of endorphins, which most of us think of as a happy chemical, but is actually the body's most powerful natural analgesic opioid as well. It's a numbing agent. That's slightly different than what you'd expect based on the ancient Greeks catharsis theory, which posited that watching terrible things was a visceral and painful experience that helps us void ourselves of uncomfortable emotions, the way you might lance a boil to release the swelling. Sorry, that's gross. Um, science suggests instead that at least for those of us with a trauma history, which in my opinion is every human being on the earth, um, watching violent imagery might actually be a way of blunting the sharp edges of the emotions and physical responses associated with unprocessed trauma by placing them in a simulated context where those responses kind of make sense. Under both theories, the viewer gets a little relief, but in the latter, that relief is not exactly a release. Fulci himself suffered an enormous amount of trauma throughout his life. And I, I don't know a lot about his backstory, but um, some of it is very famous. His wife, Maria Fulci, died by suicide in 1969 after learning she had an operable cancer right around the time he began his pivot into giallo films, thrillers, and horror, a full 20 years into his filmmaking career. He made a lot of other movies that were not this dark before he uh, got into it. Several years later, his daughter Camilla was gravely injured in a horseback riding accident, which temporarily paralyzed her and led to a lifetime of ensuing health problems. Fulci was plagued by his own, own health problems, which would lead to him abandoning several projects midstream, including the filming of Zombie 3, which I have not seen. Um, he also may have been feuding with producers over a script he found silly, as he was known for doing throughout his career. Um, his finances fell into ruin in the later years of his life, thanks in no small part to his strained relationship with many of his colleagues in the Italian filmmaking community. Um, and he died penniless at the age of 68, um, anecdotally, after turning to Dario Argento, his nemesis, <laughs> to try to get a film made, which he reportedly was very embarrassed to have to do. Um, but though many of the dramas in Fulci's life were the result of his own tempestuousness, Fulci himself seems to have viewed his own story through the lens of the larger traumas that were inflicted upon him. His best known Italian language biography was entitled The Eye of the Witness. The director himself came up with that title. 
In the experimental documentary about his life, Fulci for Fake, Fulci's daughter suggested um, that hints of those formative traumas are scattered throughout their father's body of work. They talk about it as like a mosaic that you can see if you stand back after watching all hundred some of his films. Um, the specifics are veiled by curtains of gore and the director's mesmerizingly enigmatic approach to storytelling, but they're there. Neither woman provides any hints as to which elements of Fulci's biography are nested within Zombie 2. But uh, personally, I think one obvious way to read the film is as an all-purpose analgesic for a predominantly white Western audience raised in a society built upon the vast trauma of colonization, an audience who on some level feels every, fears every day that the full terror of what they've done will someday rise up from the underworld of their collective consciousness and seize them as we should as white people. Or you are perfectly welcome to forget all about film theory, trauma theory, all of that, and just experience zombie as the deeply campy, kind of draggy, blood-soaked schlock masterpiece that it is. An undeniable part of the pleasure of this film um, is the way that it combines the blatant silliness of, for example, unnecessarily salacious semi-nude scuba diving scenes, uh, Love, I do love that scene <laughs> with moments of legitimate terror, not to mention sober artistic ambition. Yes, Zombie is a capital F film, but it's also undeniably a lowercase m movie, not to mention one that was marketed under a truly perfect catalog of various names that includes not just Zombie and Zombie 2, but also Zombie Flesh Eaters, The Dead Walk Among Us, The Island of the Living Dead, Nightmare Island, and the truly cringy voodoo, sorry. Let's be honest, the experience of Fulci's work in general simply wouldn't be the same without the low budget sackcloth zombie costumes and shrieking overacting ingenues, sorry Olga Carlatos, but I actually love that about her performance, and the dissonant proggy soundtracks. Part of his brilliance is the way the glorious cheapness of the horror genre complicates and compounds the beauty and legitimate impressiveness of much of his filmmaking. Cheapness is something that I think is really amazing about horror. It's what gets so many, damn many of these films made. They're very cheap to produce, but it also gives them a quality that feels accessible and doable by anyone who wants to make a work of art. When people ask me why I enjoy super violent horror films, and I've gotten this question from approximately 100% of my relatives, I often try to explain that enjoy isn't exactly the word. Enjoyment implies pleasure. Um, and as a certified weenie and non-sadist who faints when I see blood in real life, of course, I am never exactly delighted to watch another human being getting violently killed, even if that human being is a campy actress in a bad wig and the violence is clearly ersatz. The experience of watching a film like Fulci Zombie isn't anything as neat as delight. Rather, it's an unnameable feeling of dissonance that I think we all experience when presented with a work of art that is simultaneously beautiful and also complete trash, exuberantly fake, but also uncomfortably true, deeply problematic in ways that the filmmaker himself probably didn't understand and intermittently transcendent all at once. I don't know about you, but I find that dissonance fascinating and kind of irresistible. Um, so I'm going to keep it kind of short today because I want to talk about what you liked and didn't like and just the physical experience of watching a film like this because it's we're all doing that alone in our houses and it would be very cool to talk uh, with other people about anything. So um, I'm going to stop it here and open the floor to questions. I'm going to remove this guy from my screen. So please do everyone uh, put your questions down in uh, usually the Q&A boxes where they are less prone to getting ignored. Although if you put them in the chat, I'll do my best to relay them there too. As you're typing in your questions, I guess I'll start. Um, you talked about how uh, Zombie is both a capital F film and a lowercase m movie. That's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, I don't know, just in film fans, genre studies, things like that, where the line is between trash films and art films, if there even is a line. But I think you're in kind of a unique position to discuss that, given that you wrote serious literature about a trash film. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about maybe if that line exists, where it is, where Zombie Falls, where Fulci Falls, etc. That's a great question. Um, and thank you for saying my book is serious literature. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Um, I certainly thought it was like literary fiction. So did my editor. That's how it was marketed. And yet it ended up in the horror section of a whole lot of bookstores around the country. And that's something that I have come to embrace over time, but felt very weird about <laughs> to start. Um, yeah, I, I think the tension between 
what qualifies as art, what qualifies as trash, what kinds of filmic uh, violence is dramatic and what kind is exploitative is a really lively one. And it kind of your mileage may vary. I think for the most part, things tend to get classed as horror and particularly trash horror, the more it borrows from other films in its space. Um, the more it's an act of recycling, which is ironic considering that we call these things trash. Um, and I've, I've always sort of chafed against that because I, I think all stories borrow from other stories. I think literary fiction has just as many tropes as horror. They're just not as visible um, because they're not literally tied together by you know a very specific tight filmic vocabulary of like, we're going to kill people here <laughs> in every single one. Uh, so I think Fulci for me, the zombie, I think hovers between the two because if you summarize this film, it sounds like trash. If you watch this film, you recognize how daring it is and how weird it is. Um, even the scenes that are most famous for like, you know, something that someone would show someone else in their basement to dare them not to vomit are incredibly strange in their choices. And the thing I talk a lot about when I teach fiction is that any story can be amazing if you make interesting choices that are unexpected, even if the action of the scene is exactly the same as something you've read before, how you tell it matters. Um, so yeah, I, I think for me, it's both gloriously both, um, but I would be curious to hear what other people have to say. A question just popped up as you were talking. I haven't read it yet. Um, I'll go ahead and read it out here though. It's from Joshua Ray. He says, I would love to hear more, sorry, I would love to hear what other horror films Kia enjoys that some of us might not know about other than the four, four full keys that we're all about to watch. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, so I watch everything. I'm like incredibly gluttonous. Uh, I watch even things that I hate. <laughs> like it's just sort of all, always been my, uh, my blessing and my curse is that I, I uh, there, there are films that I, I definitely capital E enjoy. And then there are films that I put on in the background while I'm watching dinner, like Leprechaun franchise that still like soothe my mind. You know, I've learned a little bit about myself in this trauma analysis that I gave to Zombie 2. Um, I'll, I've been watching a lot of horror through the pandemic with a group of friends, some of which I think might be here tonight, uh, who are, we've been like putting them on and chatting about it on Discord. So I'll just say a few I've liked lately that I, I've discovered and found really wonderful. Um, I liked Vivarium a lot that came out this year. That's a, a recent one. That's like a very unusual, surrealist uh, movie starring the guy from The Social Network, whose name escapes me right now, and Imogen Poots. Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah. Um, Imogen Poots is becoming something of a scream queen, and I'm here for it. Um, it's about a couple that goes to view a house in the suburbs, and then they become trapped in a uh, other reality there and cannot leave. And it goes in some very, very bizarre directions that it feels like an Amelia Gray short story, if you know that writer, that's the best way I can kind of pin it down. And it's so, so good. Um, I saw for the first time, uh, oh, no, what is that one called? <laughs> um, well, last night we watched a St. Louis horror film, uh, Being the Patient by Karen Kusama, which I'd seen before, but I loved even more now that I'm reading Sandy Tan's Lurkers about LA. It's a very Los Angeles story about a man who gets an invitation to a dinner party at his uh, ex-wife's house and discovers very quickly that her his ex-wife and his new partner have a very interesting agenda for this dinner. I, I won't spoil it more because that's definitely a film that uses dread and suspense in a really beautiful way and it, it does get bloody but you gotta wait for it. Um, and then I'm trying to think some, some more like older films that I've watched recently. Black Christmas. I saw the original Black Christmas for the first time. I don't think I'm really like giving you deep cuts here because I don't I don't I don't know what is a deep cut and what isn't because I just watch so damn much of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to recommend you something personally if you would tell me in the chat what you have enjoyed recently. <laughs> That's probably the best way. He actually did ask another question. Um, we, the questions are starting to pile in, which I'm happy about. But before I forget, I want to go back to um, answer before last. Um, you were talking about um, like one of the things that defines trash cinema is how much it steals from other things. Um, I was interested with regard to zombies specifically. Um, it's got that very obvious reference to Jaws, which you talked about. And you spoke really um, 
lucidly about it. I, I really appreciate what you had to say about that, um, or about the whole thing really, but especially that. Um, but then it's got, like, it seems to kind of reference King Kong. Um, it's got the, um, the opening sequence may or may not be a reference to the Great Train Robbery, the 1903 film where the bandit shoots the gun right in the camera. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what you think uh, Fulci is up to with these things. If it's deliberate homage, or if it's like a shorthand film language, or if it's like a Shrek style, like unmotivated visual <laughs> quote, like what, um, how intelligent and how deliberate is he being with these references? Boy, um, I, I have to be honest that I don't care how intelligent he's being with it. Um, I, I, I get a lot of pleasure from seeing from finding easter eggs and things um whether or not they were placed there deliberately i like one of the things i like the most about horror films is that it feels like they're all sort of spider web together like how i talked about how i'm very okay with considering this a sequel to george a. romero's work even though <laughs> romero did not authorize that and neither did fulci um because all one of the pleasures of horror is that they are all sort of drawing from the same creative well um I, I, w I should say that Fulci, like, you know, Great Train Robbery is probably accurate because he directed a lot of the spaghetti westerns. You know, this is a spaghetti horror film at the end of the day. Uh, I, I think that he probably was a director who put some of these things in deliberately to amuse himself and other things were just part of the creative seep that we all get when we are students of a genre. Um, and I you know, when, when I teach fiction in particular, I caution students like not to worry about that. Like I think refer being referential and stealing outright from other works is an act of great honor that you do to other makers. I think it's like something that we should embrace. And of course, all movies are made of other movies. And of course, all books are made of other books. So um, yeah, I, I'm not willing to really play like you know, reference police and say whether or not it was a smart th and deliberate thing to do. I like that it's there and I'm enjoying it. All right, sounds good to me. Um, let me ask some of the audience questions. Um, Aaron Abishan, who's speaking in a few weeks, um, he says that zombie seems like a good introduction to Fulci's horror films for the uninitiated. Do you think it's a good first Fulci or would you suggest another and why? That's interesting. Um, I haven't watched like every film so I'm probably not the best person to ask this but um, I think what stuck out to me about this film it, it is a good introduction in the sense that like this was certainly his most commercially successful film it's going to tread a lot of uh, filmic ground that will be familiar to most people I think folks who have never watched horror typically have seen a zombie film or two on a date you know like if only because Romero remade his entire catalog <laughs> in the 90s and 2000s and um, so in that sense it's a little bit more inviting uh, but for me when I think of typical like what typifies Fulci I think of the beyond and frankly the other the other films in the series um, I, I, I think what it's falling down here uh, my I'm really interested in like the women in, in Fulci's film. And I think this is probably not for lack of trying because like Aretta Gay and Olga Carlatos and Tisa Farrow do beautiful performances in this. This is probably the film that's like the least, uh, has the least like draggy femme energy, which is kind of what I love about his work. I, I would start with the beyond personally, but like it kind of depends on where your levels are at to start. Like if you've seen some John Carpenter, start with the beyond, like you can handle it. Um, if you've seen anything else from the seventies, that's like a little bit challenging and weird, start with something challenging and weird. Um, but it, it, your mileage may vary. Uh, that was something we talked about actually in the buildup to these events. I'm glad Aaron thought to, cause there, we try to start with the, the most approachable film, like either their best known or the easiest entry. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that came up. Um, so Aaron Christensen, again, our speaker next week, um, he has a question. He says, I'm sorry I joined late, uh, so you might have already addressed this, but where do you feel that, sorry, where do you feel this lives in the zombie hierarchy? Where would you rank it within Romero's series and how do you feel it directly influenced other films beyond the Italian imitators? Yikes, um, that's tough. So Night of the Living Dead, the original one is my favorite movie of all the movies, probably. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna, um, I, I think that that film is just so smart and interesting. And, uh, you know, I talked about the incredible racism in this film. I think, uh, 
when someone says like horror is a racist genre, I'm like, you should watch the original line of Living Dead. You're gonna get a more nuanced picture of that because that explores, I think, uh, racial politics of the period in a really sensitive and interesting way. Um, how would I rank it? I think like Italian zombie films in general, and this is not the only one, uh, have their own flavor that makes me sort of resistant to wanting to like stack them up in a hierarchy because they're kind of doing their own thing. They have elements of giallo, they have elements of, uh, like Dada, honestly, I, you know, in the, the copy for this event, we talked to, um, Pete talked really well about how, uh, what's Man Ray's, um, Shana de Lou, I don't speak French, um, that sort of like has some connective tissue with that splinter in the eyeball scene. Um, so I, I kind of just want to put them on their own little island. <laughs> um, I, I think this is one of the most unique zombie films that is out there that, uh, especially for this early in the genre. Um, there is a second part to that question that I'm forgetting right now. Uh, Let me see. Back up. It is, um, yeah, where would you rank it within Romero series and how do you feel it directly influenced other films beyond the Italian imitators? Influences. Um, yeah, so this is something that I, I hope we would get to in the Q&A. Um, so Fulci has been cited as a reference by a lot of filmmakers that I do not like. <laughs> it's the thing that's like, I have to be just like honest. I don't like talking about like how I don't like work, but I feel like Eli Roth is probably gonna be fine. He's never gonna know that I'd said that um, Cabin Fever is a bad movie. Um, but like Fulci has been cited a lot as like an influence on this cache of directors like Rob Zombie, um, Folks, who's the guy who made Evil Dead? I'm blanking on names. Sam Raimi. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sam Raimi. Um, who do body horror in a very flamboyant way <laughs> that is very interested in like making you look at it and is a little sadistic. Um, I don't think Fulci's sadistic. I think he has so much more going on, especially when you start layering in the production design and this like really weird soundtracking and the fact that narratively things are a little bit more challenging and sophisticated than like Eli Roth's Hostel, which is like a movie that a anyone could have written who is just a mean person. <laughs> so I, I think like, I unfortunately, Fulci has influenced a lot of people who didn't like glom on to the things that I like about his work, um, which is that he is a interesting filmmaker who has a lot of fascinating contrasts and like kind of toothy juxtapositions in a way that, um, I, I think like, I, I see a little bit of it in, you know, movies like It Follows, certainly like the, the slow horror <laughs> sort of movement that's seeing a renaissance now. Yeah, that's a, a short answer, but I would love to hear your answers too. I know you know a lot about this. So while, um, if Aaron wants to type in something, Aaron Christensen, uh, feel free, Aaron. Um, but while we're waiting, um, we have yeah, the questions here. Everyone's always so afraid to go first. And then once like the seal is broken, they all come. Um, so Joshua Ray is going back to the earlier question uh, when you were talking about watching a lot of horror during the pandemic. Um, he says that he's also been watching a lot of horror during the pandemic and he finds them so soothing and he wants to know if we're okay. I mean, we're not okay, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you know, like, of course we're not okay. It would be weird if we're not okay. I mean, look, like it, it took me a long time to figure out that like why I like horror was because like it, fits into a slot in my brain that very bad things have gone into in the past. Um, but that's a, a good thing um, because once you're in that space, then you have the freedom to like look around and say like, okay, what are the artistic choices being made? Um, I, I mean, I found pandemic horror soothing in part because I have a group of people I'm watching it with um, who I'm talking about it. like one of the things that we don't talk about as much in horror is that it's a really social that like film experience when you go to a horror movie and everyone's screaming at this like don't go in there um like that that is very weird and unusual in movie theaters these days outside of maybe comedies but like we don't usually it's not usually that interactive in the medium um so i think like part of why we watch horror is because we want to connect with other people and even if those other people are not there um, it's a natural impulse to want to do it, um, to, to, to want to like replicate that experience even in your house during this time. So no, we're not okay, but it's okay that we're not okay. <laughs> well, thanks. I feel reassured at least. <laughs> Hopefully everyone else does too. Yeah. Um, so next up, we've got a question from Kate Lohr, 
Uh, Kate says, um, she offers her own theory and then she gets into the question. Um, so my own little horror theory is that it can sometimes be like sniffing spoiled milk. When I sniff the milk, that there's an opportunity for psychoanalysis of my own trauma. I also go for the second sniff and then I want to make everyone in my house hold the smell too. That's not just me, right? What kind of horror films or novels or moments of terror turn you into a milk sniffer? And what, and what makes you want to make your friends sniff the milk? Wow. I don't have that impulse, but I like it. And you seem fun. Um, so uh, yeah, we were talking a little bit before we started about um, Faces of Death, <laughs> which is, I think, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm not recommending Faces of Death, just like I don't recommend that anyone watch Campbell Holocaust. Um, Faces of Death is like a mostly fake smeary series of like snuff films that you know would say if you're like we're going to show you live footage of a real execution of a guy dying in a gas chamber but like it was never a real guy in the gas chamber and that's the kind of um horror that like you dare your friends to watch like you're daring them to sniff the milk <laughs> um i think that there is something really fun about egging someone on to you know watch a horror film the way you would egg them to like take a you know, jump in the pool with their clothes on or something like that. Um, but I think it has to be the kind of horror that gives you permission to treat it as a little bit of a gag. Um, and it depends on the person. I, I certainly never recommend horror films to people who like, just don't want to watch them. Like I, I know enough people who like to do this, that if I'm having buddy movie night and everyone else wants to watch Mrs. Doubtfire, like I'm never putting anyone through that. I have like a very banal movie watching club during the pandemic where we watched Hook the other day, like frankly, the Robin Williams movie. Um, but yeah, I like that theory. Sniff the milk. I'm gonna steal that. It's good. Yeah, when I when I asked it, she typed in another question. It's not really a question. She typed in that she thinks she outed herself as a milk sniffing sadist. <laughs> um, let me get one over here. This is from Dan Yesvik. Um, he says, "Thanks very much. I think I think I like your rich criticism of the perverse production values of exploitation horror more than the movie itself, and I really love the movie and Fulci's others." I find it fascinating that the more mainstream zombie wave of Walking Dead and of shambling copycats and parodies so clearly owe much more to Fulci, Romero, Diodato, but for some reason there's not been a lot of new love interest recapitulation of their earlier works. Any thoughts there? Um, so why Fulci didn't get a lot of love? I think the the thing that I've read a lot is that like he's in the shadow of Dario Argento, which like I kind of never got. Um, so Dario Argento, for people who aren't familiar, is probably the best known Italian filmmaker of this period. He's um, did films like uh, Deep Red and Suspiria and lots of things that have been remade many, many, many times. And I think that lazy people group them together because they both have that thing in, uh, in Giallo of like a little bit of a subconscious nightmarish associativeness to their scripts where things are kind of skipping around and feeling a little bit odd. Um, I think Fulci was overshadowed in that sense, but also he just wasn't distributed very well. And, you know, his most commercially successful film, Zombie, was banned in the UK. Um, that fueled its popularity in spaces like um, Late Night Grindhouse. Love that, by the way. Um, but in other circles, that makes him sort of gives him a reputation that he might not deserve. I actually, besides like two scenes in this movie, I don't find this movie like out and out upsetting um, for the most part. It's certainly stylized in a way that makes it exciting and fun to analyze and chew on in addition to just like be flattened by. Um, I, I, I think Fulci is in, in for a renaissance, especially from, uh, an audience that would be a little bit more patient with his weirdness because he is very weird. And I think he's one of those, one of those horror writers whose weirdness is underappreciated. I've got a quick comment from Charles Jacobson, um, who um, I'm not sure that there's a question here, but he always says intelligent things in the chat. So I wanted to make sure to get it out there. Um, the pilotless sailboat and zombie seems related to seems related to the pilotless sailboat with the vampire coffin and rats in the 1979 horror picture Nosferatu. I believe the two boats serve to both introduce the protagonist. <laughs> yeah. um, so the next question is from Jared Hamline. Um, you made references to zombie movies touching on things like colonialism and racism, amongst other things. Is this something that you touch upon in your novel? Hell yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for me, my novel is a novel about like the way whiteness acts in spaces that it wants to seize. 
honestly. Um, I mean, you can tell me what you think it's about. It's got its own life outside of me, but um, yeah. So the production of Cannibal Holocaust very famously took place in a little tiny town called Leticia, Colombia, uh, where there was still an active indigenous population. Um, it, however, before the crew got there, it was literally colonized by an American guy from Tampa, Florida, who flew down there um, and was like, I'm gonna be an exotic animal trainer. And um, also I'm going to smuggle a lot of cocaine with parakeets in my airplanes at my airport that I own. And he was a really dangerous guy. He went to prison for many, many, many years. Um, and I, he's a character in the book or a version of him is to be clear. Um, and yeah, I, I see the book primarily as scrutinizing the way that when white artists and also white entrepreneurs and just white tourists in general enter into a space that isn't theirs, what they do with that and how they uh, can inflict themselves upon other people. Um, so yeah, I, I do do my best to dissect it. I'm sure there are things I, I missed. I know there are things I missed because I've learned things since the book came out. Um, but yeah, it's it's a thing. <laughs> Let me know what you think after you read it. Um, I should mention, I meant to in my introduction and I forgot, uh, Left Bank Books has discounted Kia's book for the duration of this series. So if you get it from Left Bank, um, it's 20% off. And I think they have signed copies left too, but I need to confirm that. Um, if they have signed copies, we'll do our best to get them to you. If you tell um, me what you want me to sign it as, I will come in and personalize them. Right. <laughs> I don't. That? We'll make it work. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question about you. I've got a couple more from the audience, and we're starting to run out of time, so I'll try not to eat up all the time here. But related to your book, there's a conversation in the end between your white colon colonial colonialist Hank and the Diodato stand-in um, Ugo. I guess I'm probably mm -hmm. mispronouncing his name. Um, but they talk about uh, like where the success and where the pleasure is in the horror movie, whether it's in the formula or whether it's just in the kill scenes. Um, do you, where do you land in this argument and how do you think it applies to zombie? Um, anywhere you want it to be. I don't know. <laughs> I, I never want to police anyone else's pleasure in general, but specifically not in horror. Um, because I think that there's an axis that you can read zombie, films like zombie on, which is just craft, just style, just connecting it and to other works in the genre and seeing how it stacks up and taking pleasure in those resonances. And then there's also, um, yeah, it is kind of fun to watch a kill scene sometimes, if only because it activates that weird part of your brain that releases some nice, mind chemicals <laughs> and helps you cope with the world as it is and the world is a lot right now um yeah all of the above all right it sounds good uh we've got two more from the audience uh it's 759 i should mention uh, we got cut off last week at 804 we got booted out unceremoniously so apologies in advance if that happens again um, but for now, uh, Dominic Duffner says, um, have you watched any of Fulci's or Diodato's non-horror films and have any thoughts on them? I'm curi curious if there are any thematic or stylistic parallels. That's a no. That's any of you want to say. Any of the others. So we can move on. Sorry. Okay. Um, so with... Uh, sorry, my last question here is from Andy Treifenbach, um, who's the late night grind, grind, light, late night grind house person um, who's speaking in two weeks. He says, Fulci seems to have really ushered in the start of what I think extreme or gore cinema with some of his 80s output. While I always felt he had something more to say, but was often bogged down by exploitation standards to appease audiences and producers. What is your go-to Fulci film and or what is a unique film of his that you find more fascinating on a deeper, deeper level? Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, I'm gonna curveball it here. I like Lizard and the Woman's Skin a lot. I really do. <laughs> I think it's like such a super like campy, weird, gross, sexy, queer movie that I like think is really fantastic. Um, but honestly, the films in this series are really good. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on Fulci's entire catalog, but The Beyond is, is a beautiful movie in a lot of ways with some imagery that I find truly haunting. Um, Don't Tartar a Duckling has some incredible incredible, incredible acting moments in particular. And um, I, I cannot wait to hear what we all think about those mannequins <laughs> and how they're used uh, in, in that particular film. City of the Living Dead has some of the most like haunting individual juxtapositions that I think I've ever seen. Like when the maggots fall out of the ceiling and the ones, I, I can't wait to <laughs> talk about it. Um, I'm a geek for all this stuff if you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really just, uh, 
New York Rippers. I, yeah, I, I, I like them all. <laughs> and um, I think that they can all be enjoyed as a collective sort of bunch as well. And it's a good way to spend a weekend to marathon a whole bunch of these and scramble your brain around a little bit. I think lizard in a women's woman's skin was the correct answer because the sh the chat and the Q and A blew up when you said that everyone's very oh, happy. With that <laughs> Even though it's very fraught, but they're all fraught, you know? and that's that that's one that I, I hope when you do Fulton theories round two, we can talk about that one. I do. One last question popped up, and then we should stop after that. Um, it's from Charles Jacobson. He says, "Have you seen I Walked with a Zombie, which also has a good story with murder, romance, which is col colonialism and suicide." No, <laughs> I, will, I will add it to the list. Um, there was, zombies are actually not like my number one genre, but I have seen a lot of them, just not that one. If it humors you, Charles, you'd be interested to know uh, when we were discussing who to, which director to focus on for the series. We talked about Jacques Turner um, and Val Luton. Um, yeah, he, he came up for discussion, but it wound up going in the direction of Fulci, which I feel pretty good about at the moment. Um, so thanks again for everyone that's coming. Um, Kia said so in the lead up, but I don't know how many of you were logged on at the time. Um, she's doing an event with the filmmaker slash novelist Sandy Tan with Left Bank Books on um, April 12th. It's a Monday evening. They're doing it on their Facebook Live page. That's not my event. I go to left-bankbook.com, left sorry. Um, and you can, you can get to the event there. That's also where you can get copies of Kia's book, both discounted and signed. And um, we'll have one copy to give away and a couple of Fulci puzzles too, but that won't be until the end of the month. So what you should do is buy it now and read it. And then when you win a copy, just give it to your friends or give it to your one friend. Anyway, um, I hope to, hope to see you come back next week for Aaron Christensen and uh, City of the Living Dead and all the events thereafter. And Kia, thank you so much. It's been a yeah, real pleasure. Thank you. It was fun. Really appreciate everyone coming out. Take care.